without further ado, here we have Father Gregory Pine giving us an incredible talk on the possibility of perfection. Let's go. <laughs> that's, that's the best introduction I've heard in some time, so kudos. Um, right, so it's a pleasure to be with you. Let's start with a prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grant us grace, O merciful God, to desire ardently all that is pleasing to thee, to examine it prudently, to acknowledge it truthfully, and to accomplish it perfectly, for the praise and glory of thy name, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Our Lady Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right. So, <clears throat> is it possible to be perfect? We hear it said, uh, quoth the Lord at the end of Matthew chapter 5, Be therefore perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So the goal of Christian life is to become like the Lord in this uh, particular and peculiar way. So we are called to be like him in a way that's not just like symbolic or metaphorical, but real, which is to say, you know, we're not supposed to become God in the strict sense, but we are to be partakers in the divine nature. We are to be filled to overflowing with creative grace uh, in such a way that can adequately be described as perfect. So we have this high calling. But on the other hand, when we are confronted with our smallness, our weakness, our pettiness, our insecurity, our foolishness, whatever, uh, the goal can seem very distant, uh, nigh unto impossible. And especially so when you compare yourself to the feats or the transports of great saints like St. John of the Cross or St. Pio of Pietrelcina or whomever, right? And at that point, <clears throat> when you know, the, I, the ideal no longer animates hope. It can actually serve to distress or even to dispirit us. It's like, all right, I'm called to be perfect. I see these saints in the tradition uh, living a kind of marvelous perfection. And yet that to me seems so very far off. It seems so very distant. It seems nigh to impossible. And as a result of which, perhaps I am not called to live out the fullness of Christian life. Perhaps this vocation is beyond me. So, what we're asking in this uh, short time that we have together uh, is whether it's possible to live this way. Um, is it possible to be perfect? So let's start with the consideration of what perfection is. He sips his chai. Right. Do you guys have Trader Joe's in Ireland? No? Okay. It's like a very inexpensive American store where you can get quality products. Then they have like very minimalistic packaging. Um, you know how everything's kind of like bold and bright and overstated, like best toothpaste in the freaking world. Um, Trader Joe's is just kind of like, yeah, this is a thing with stuff. Um, so this is their spiced chai. You mix in a little bit of a uh, almond milk or almond beverage. Very delicious. So I recommend it if you ever come to the States. All right. So what is, uh, what is perfection? Uh, like just looking at the word, it means to be made through. You can think about it as to be made through and through. <clears throat> Um, and specifically, it means that that is perfect, which lacks nothing proper to God's design for it. All right. So each thing is called to be perfect in the way that it is called to be perfect. That seems very obscure, Father Gregory. What could you possibly mean? All right. Well, let's like walk through. We are called to be perfect in a specifically human way. So we can compare this to other modes of perfection like rocks. What does it mean to be a perfect rock, right? A perfect rock is, is, is perfectly rocky, right? So it resists being broken up. It responds to the law of gravity. If it's shale, you know, it's kind of slick or sleek. If it's mica, it's shimmery and, you know, kind of like comes off in little flakes. But, but to be a perfect rock is the norm or the standard for that is, you know, just to be rocky. Okay. Um, or like uh, a plant. What does it mean to be a perfect plant? Well, you know, it has beautiful blossoms or flowers. It in some cases gives beautiful fruits. Um, you know, it's, it's roots extend to the earth, it's branches extend to the sky, it looks healthy, it looks balanced, etc. Now, these types of perfections are helpful for understanding what it means to be perfect, but <clears throat> we haven't yet risen to the level of human perfection. Um, so what does it mean then for like an animal to be perfect? Because we are animals, right? But we're a peculiar kind of animal. So like yesterday I was playing cricket in my backyard with one of my, well, a bunch of my Dominican brothers. And, um, you know, whenever you experience some type of failure in a sporting event, you you instantly go to thoughts of how you could have done better, how it could have gone otherwise. <clears throat> and um, like the next time that you go out there on the pitch, how you will be the hero of the game and you won't get out in that, you know, like 
seemingly reckless way that you did previously. Now, on the one hand, this is hilarious uh, because it's cricket and no, no one cares. Um, but on the other hand, too, uh, like our perfection extends beyond being excellent at sporting matches, right? So uh, it's not too terribly important whether or not you are great at soccer or, you know, like hurling or Gaelic football or I don't know other things in Ireland. Okay, so um, <clears throat> because those are kind of like perfections of your body, they're perfections of your like sense perception, but you haven't yet gotten to the question of what it means to be perfect as a human being, okay? So when we talk about being a perfect human being, we're talking about something that's beyond rock perfection, it's beyond tree perfection, it's beyond animal perfection. But we also wanna situate it as below the perfections which exceed ours. So like angels, for instance, are perfect in a peculiar way because angels only really have one moment of choice and then an eternal life of beatitude. So we call that angel perfect, which chooses for God after its creation and then abides in that choice for all eternity. But angels, you know, they don't have to undergo, you know, growth and decay. They don't um, come to the discovery of different things as the result of many different steps, et cetera. You know, like angels just see and then they move and then that's it. Right. Or you can think about God, divine perfection. God just is perfection. He exhausts all that there is of being, of truth and of goodness. Um, so he is abiding perfection. Our perfection is situated in between the lower and the higher. So in order to understand what it means for a human person to be perfect, we have to understand what it means to be a human being, right? And then how we realize that humanity in a way that leaves nothing to be desired. So what are we made for? And then how do we get there is a good way to kind of structure that consideration. What are we made for? We are made for the loving vision of God. So we are meant, oh, I should, I should mention too, sometimes when you're on Zoom and somebody starts talking without interruption, you get a little bit nervous that they'll never stop talking. My plan is to speak for 35 to like 38 minutes. I think I started speaking at like 306. So that puts us at like 341 when I conclude. So fear not. <clears throat> okay. Um, so how then, uh, excuse me, what are we made for and how do we go about in pursuit thereof? So we're made for the, the, the loving vision of God, sometimes referred to as the beatific vision. Um, and we are to ascend to that loving vision of God by kind of living it now, as it were. So to, to grow in knowledge and to grow in love are these peculiarly human perfections. We have minds with which to know, we have hearts with which to love, and each is to be kind of grown in its capacity and perfected in its exercise. I just realized that my, um, my fan is on over here, which probably is really loud on my microphone. Nice. Just wanna let you know that I have such great affection that I will sweat for the next 30 minutes uh, as a sign of my love. <clears throat> um, it, it just gets really stuffy in here. Welcome to Washington, D.C. It's a swamp, inhospitable. Okay. Um, so we are meant to ascend to the loving vision of God by knowing and by loving. So how then do we grow in our capacity for God, our capacity to see him and to love him and enter into his beatitude? The Christian tradition responds to this by the life of virtue, right? By the life of virtue. So how do you increase your capacity to receive what God reveals of himself? By faith. How do you increase your capacity to love with God's own love? By charity. How do you increase your capacity to exercise a certain restraint over your own emotional life? By temperance and by fortitude. How do you perfect your capacity to interact with other human beings in a way that adequately um, respects what they are due by justice? How do you make good decisions by, you know, et cetera. You see how this is going. So the life of virtue is what perfects our capacities to know God and to love God and, and, and to live a perfect human life. Um, but we can kind of encapsulate our discussion or summarize it in a consideration of charity because charity is bound up with perfection in a peculiar sense, Right. Uh, we, we sometimes hear charity referred to in the Christian tradition as the substance of Christian perfection. Why? Well, because charity is what brings all of the virtues to their term. Ultimately, we are meant not merely to be prudent for prudence sake, not merely to be just for justice sake. We are meant to be prudent, to be just, to be courageous, to be temperate for the love of God. The ultimate referent of all of our actions is for the love of God. And so charity gives us the capacity to love God with his own love and our neighbor with the same and to kind of introduce our whole life into this um, loving ambiance. It makes it such that all of one's thoughts, words, and deeds uh, become a love song, kind of like a, a love song to the Savior. So uh, what we are about then 
in life is a kind of pursuit of perfect charity. And, and this is good news because uh, to the extent that you grow in charity, thereby you enjoy a greater share or a greater portion of the beatific vision. So as St. Therese observed, all persons will be um, filled with God in heaven, uh, but some will be buckets and some will be thimbles. So you will be filled, filled to overflowing, but your capacity to receive God's outpouring of himself is proportionate to how well, how intensely, to what extent you loved in the days that led up to your last breath. So um, now, charity being the substance of Christian perfection is especially important for our consideration of what it means to be perfect. We want to grow in charity. Um, how do we go about doing that? Well, one thing just to kind of say at the outset is that you can never have enough charity on the one hand, on the other hand, you can, but like on the other hand, there's, there's no point at which you can say, ah, yes, I am sufficiently charitable for today, for tomorrow, for this week, probably for the month. So I can hang my hat on my little hat rack and then I can, you know, peacefully, blissfully repose on my couch while I am, fed seedless fruits uh, whilst binge watching Netflix shows. Seedless fruits is a very, you know, it's, it's a very important part of that image. God forbid that you have to spit out seeds from a watermelon. Right. So um, there's no point at which you can say like, I am sufficiently charitable. Why? Because, because charity can always stand to increase. So you are infinitely capacious. God is infinitely generous and charity is a kind of quasi infinity. So there's always growth to be had. Now, this seems a little bit terrifying, though, because if I can never arrive, what's the point of journeying? If I'm always going to be deficient, why even set about? You know, I could, I could either pursue charity for the next 65 years and then end up terribly frustrated, right, and drop, just like, just kind of wither and, um, you know, kind of like have a, a desiccated experience of Christian life by the end, or I could just quit now, <clears throat> you know, and then I could just go about worshiping the sun and make a bunch of dubious moral decisions and, you know, suck the very marrow out of life. Well, don't worry. Okay. Because just because charity cannot be exhausted, doesn't mean that you can't experience a kind of perfection of charity. Even now, St. Thomas will say like when the Lord says in the gospel that you are to, or he repeats from the old Testament that you are to love the Lord with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. What he's talking about is the totality of offering. It's a matter of referring your mind, your heart, your soul, and your strength to God. Not necessarily of, you know, experiencing at each moment an infinite knowledge and love of God, but rather of having the desire to grow, right? Willing a higher state, not being satisfied or um, maybe satisfied isn't the right word, but not being overly content with what the Lord has given, but seeking always in each gift that he does give to recognize that it's kind of daisy chains to further gifts that provided you consent and cooperate with what he does offer, that he will continue to prove himself generous. So effectively, it's a matter of, you know, willing a higher state. Who's going to do this in your life? God is going to do this. And you can rely upon God to give you what you need to grow, to be perfect. First Timothy 2, 4, God desires that all be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. At each moment of each day, God is giving to even the most hardened of sinners, at least the grace sufficient to pray, which isn't yet the grace of justification, but it is something, right? And provided that it is, again, consented to and cooperated with, it will flourish in a life of further and further graces. At the Second Vatican Council, in its dogmatic constitution on the church, which is called Lumen Gentium, which means light of the nations, we have um, described for us what is called the universal call to holiness. We read there, it is evident to everyone that all the faithful of Christ of whatever rank or status are called to the fullness of Christian life and to the perfection of charity. So God wants you to flourish. He wants you to be over aboundingly holy, not just, you know, thus and such, you know, not just only so good, but he wants you to be excellent, right? To burn brilliantly like the stars in the firmament. Um, he doesn't want you to sneak in the back door of heaven or to kind of claw your way to the bottom ranks of purgatory and then just hope for the best over the course of the next, you know, 15 millennia. No, the Lord wants you to go straight to heaven. And he accomplishes this by his own initiative. Beloved, we love because God first loved us. First John 4. Uh, what do you have that you have not received? If therefore you have received it, why do you boast as if it were your own? First Corinthians 4. Or every good and perfect gift comes down to us from the Father of lights, James 2. So the first point is this. 
that it depends primarily and principally on the movement of God's grace, and God wants you to be perfect. Boom. Um, for those of you who are keeping track, that's point one of like two and a half. All right. So <clears throat> the next consideration is how much grace can I rely upon God to give me? Well, here we enter into the mystery of predilection, which is a mystery. Um, well, it basically describes this, that God loves people in different ways. Now, in, in one sense, we could say that God loves some people more than others, but I'm going to nuance that claim. I'm going to put it in those terms at the outset because I want it to be maximally offensive so that way you remember it, okay? That way it haunts you in your prayers for like the next few weeks and you return to it with a kind of disquietude and discomfiture, all right? So I want, I want to hammer it and then I'm also going to nuance it. So God loves some people more than others. You hear that and you're like, yikes, this guy is creepy. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, First off, I'm going to cite an authority. St. Thomas writes just this, prima pars, question 20, article three. All right, somebody who knows how to navigate the Summa on the internet, go to Aquinas101.com and click on the Summa Theologiae tab, then go to the first part and click on article, excuse me, question 20, and then click on article three and then grab that link and then throw it in the chat. So in that article, St. Thomas says that God loves some people more than others. What does he mean by that? Well, God is simple. So there's no like complexity in God. God's not like, God doesn't have like an app whereby he registers like how different people are faring. And then he like makes different adjustments on his app. Like give this person two grace points, give this person like half of a grace point, you know, like God's not like making different adjustments as if he had all of these tasks that he needed to sort. God loves us all by one simple act of his own self gift, which self gift kind of spills into creation and is our very lifeblood, our metaphysical lifeblood. So God loves all equally in the sense that he wills us all by the self-same act of love. But God gives different graces to different people, okay? And to some, he affords greater graces. So you can think here of like the Lord Jesus Christ. So we, we profess that he is a divine person in divine and human natures. So the Lord Jesus took to himself a created human nature. All right, so that's a creature. He is a man. And as man, he has habitual grace, he has, you know, capital grace, he has the grace of the hypostatic union, which is to say that he has the grace whereby his human nature is joined to the person of the second of the Trinity, right? That's, that's, that's a big grace. And if you're over there thinking like, you know, I mean, I've fared pretty well to this point, you know, and um, I see some big graces in store. I think, you know, the grace of union might be not too far off, then you're crazy, okay? Um, so there's no point at which you are going to become the incarnate son of God. So there are certain graces for which you cannot hope. And uh, if you were to hope for those things, and if you were to stand on a street corner with a sign and bellow about your hopes, we would, we would think you justly so nuts. All right. So the Lord Jesus, then you think about the blessed Virgin Mary, who is called to be the, uh, the mother of God, right? So the grace given to her that outfitted her for that ministry, that outfitted her for that place that she occupies in the divine plan is incredible. It's, it's beyond compare. Um, St. Thomas has a question, prima pars, question 25, article six, reply to the third objection, where he asks whether or not God could have created a world better than he did. And he says, yeah, because like, you know, just picture this world and then picture some improvements. He could have done that, you know, like picture Anya Lee and then picture Anya Lee with wings. Okay. The Lord could have done that. That would have been incredible. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, right. So she could, rather than having to drive, you know, two hours from Dublin to Galway, she could just fly there. That would be a better arrangement, I dare say. Just make sure that you stop at the Barack Obama Plaza. OK. Um, gosh, I drove from Dublin to Limerick um, maybe like 15 months ago and I stopped there both times. It was incredible. Um, yeah. Sweet. County Offaly has never been so good. So. Um, yeah, I, uh, I think that the, like the Lord could have done things better than he did, but St. Thomas replies in that response that there are a few things upon which he could not have improved. He says the Lord Jesus, right? So the incarnate son of God, you can't improve on that. And then he says the blessed mother, you can't improve on that either. He says something else, but that's not important. So um, you got the humanity of Christ. You've got the blessed Virgin Mary. You've got like, think of like St. Joseph, right? The, the chaste spouse of the Virgin, the father of our Lord, the you know, uh, universal protector of the church, terror of demons, great graces are accorded to him that are not accorded to us. All right. That's, that's okay. 
So God gives some greater graces than he doth others. You can also think about this in terms of certain gospel images. Think about it in terms of intimacy with Christ. So think about the way that the Lord loves the apostles. It says in Mark 3 that he called them to be with him, all right, and to preach the gospel. They're called to be close to him. Now think of the Gerasene demoniac. After the Lord drives the demons out from him, which identify themselves as legion, into the pigs, which then run off the embankment and drown in the sea, the Gerasene demoniac then tries to board the Lord's ship and say, may I accompany you? And he says, no. Think about that. Somebody asked to be with the Lord, and the Lord said, no. He said, go back to your family and tell them of what God has done for you. So God gives some people some gifts. He does not give those gifts to others. If you are as passionate about equality as most Americans that I know, you may find this uh, grating, abrasive, disgusting, repulsive, repugnant. Okay, and did he just pull up? a page from thesaurus.com. He's just, okay. Um, right. You might find this annoying at very least. All right. Because it seems to smack of like elitism or pretension, but it also seems like we're relegated to a second rank. Now here, a helpful, um, different way by which to describe it. I think it's, I think it's actually more helpful to say that God loves people differently. The more and less is true enough, right? But I think it can often confuse those who hear it. So I think we need to nuance it by saying that God loves different people differently. I was hiking earlier this month with one of my friends from college. We were up in the Adirondacks in upstate New York. If you ever get the chance, go there. Um, yeah, it's a place that's captivated the American imagination. It's very beautiful. Big lakes, big mountains, but old mountains, tired mountains, mountains that have seen things, whereas the Rocky Mountains are like upstart crows by comparison. Um, so we were hiking and I asked, him, you know, he has four kids whose names are Finn, Max, Lucy and Isabel, cute kids. And I was asking him if he likes one of them more than the others, because I just wanted to know, you know, do you have a favorite? Because among my siblings, we're four of us kids, and we always joke about who mom's favorite is. Pretty much agreed upon by all that it's me. Um, but the reason for which it's me is because I don't live at home. So she's intimately, you know, like aware of all the kind of uh, weaknesses or vices of my brother and sisters, but she's able to um, imagine that I am better than I am because I live at a distance. Right. So I was asking him, you know, do you have a favorite kid? And he thought about it and he said, no, I don't. And he was explaining to me how he loves them each differently. Um, you know, how his love for each is tailored to their, you know, very particular, uh, very individual character. And I think the Lord's love is like that, uh, but even more so. So the reason that we can appreciate the logic of the Lord's dispensation, hold on, zoom out, Father Gregory, I've gotten lost. Where are we in your organization? We're asking the question, how much grace can I rely upon God to give me? And now we're talking about it in terms of God gives different graces to different people, right? So that the real key is to find out what graces he's giving to me and to respond to those. But, but what's the sense in this? Okay, so now I'm asking that question. What's the sense in this dispensation? Why not give all equal? Why not make all to be the blessed mother? Well, because the Lord is not about a work of bland egalitarianism. The Lord doesn't care about American standards of democratic equality. He does love America most of all nations, but um, he doesn't care about that part of America. Oh, wait, I forgot my audience. My bad, guys. My bad. Wait a second. Yeah, that's it. I see some thumbs up. Cheers to you, my friend. That's what's up. That's what's up. Um, there's no thumbs down from what I understand in Zoom. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Okay, so the reason for which is this, that creation is for the manifestation of the glory of God, okay? We exist to show to the world, to show to all of creation, basically, how good God is. But the thing is that God cannot be exhausted by one created thing. It's not as if God could make like, all right, pop culture reference, Gregory, like think of something that's pertinent. Um, so like a, a recent Jurassic Park movie, you realize in like Jurassic Park 4 and Jurassic Park 5, you know, uh, whatever it is, like the lost something, what are these things called? Whatever, doesn't matter. But the, first, the last two with Chris Pratt, I don't know if you found it as ridiculous as I did. I freaking loved the first of the two. The second one was less excellent, but the first one was just incredible. I mean, when else have you seen somebody ride a dirt bike in formation with velociraptors? Never, that's when. Um, okay, but in that movie, they, they're like tr constantly trying to make the perfect dinosaur. It's like the Indominus Rex. It's like, come on, you can find a better name. And then they're like, you know what we'll do? We'll take the best dinosaur from the last movie and then we'll like fuse it with the most terrifying dinosaur from the first movie that came out in the 90s. We'll call it an Indoraptor. Okay, so like there's this 
crazed desire in Jurassic Park movies to come up with like that perfect creature. God does not suffer this delusion because he knows that no creature can adequately summarize all that is good of him. You can't just like make the perfect thing and then you look at it and say like, God is like that. We have a word for that. It's called an idol, okay? So God cannot be exhausted by one created thing. God is like white light, all right? And in order for us to capture all of the different, you know, excellences of that white light, it is passed in creation through the prism of different things. And what we have refracted is a visible spectrum of all kinds of glorious hues, all right? So each of us, each thing in creation, manifests in a unique way the glory of God. So because God cannot be exhausted by one human thing, by one human word, by one created nature, he admits of a variety of different expressions. This is like what St. Therese observed about the different lilies of the field, or excuse me, the different flowers of the field. She said, you've got like roses and violets and lilies and whatever, grape hyacinths, other things, uh, each of which says something distinct about the gardener, right? You can't all be roses because if you were all roses, then you look like, I'm looking across the street right now at the Basilica of the National Shrine. And you know, like you have these different theories about English gardens or like French gardens and the gardens over there stink. They're so geometric that it makes me think that they're not created by an intelligence. That they're created by a machine. God does not create these types of gardens. I don't remember if they're French or if they're English, but he creates the other type of one. So he does this like bewildering variety so as to show like how very overabounding is his life. And this is just the point of like the mystical body, right? We are meant to be a body. We're not meant to be a line of identical things. Because the eye does not begrudge the hand that it cannot feel, nor the foot begrudge the eye that it cannot see, because each is to be small and to play its part, okay? So this is just a way of saying that God gives different graces to different people. The real key is to identify which graces he is giving to you, which graces he is giving to me. Um, so, uh, a final thought. I think sometimes people have it in their minds that if you're to be perfect, you have to do certain things which perfection demands of you. And this comes out in a variety of ways. Dramatic effect. How much eye has grown cold. Um, so some people think like, okay, I go to this focus thing, right? And everyone's talking about a holy hour, daily mass attendance, daily rosary, praying the liturgy of the hours, having a spiritual director, going to confession every two weeks, um, cultivating excellent friendships and being a missionary. I'm not doing many of those things. So maybe I should start doing all of those things tomorrow. <laughs> all right. Um, that might not be for you. It might be for you. I don't want to discourage you from looking into that stuff. Um, but uh, I would say that, you know, of the people on this call, how many do I expect will go to daily mass five years from now? I don't know, maybe like eight. Is that good? Is that bad? I mean, it's different. I'm not talking about Sunday mass. Ani was horrified absolutely horrified. I'm not talking about Sunday mass. Okay. I'm saying how many of the people on this call are going to go to mass every day of the week, you know, for every week of the year, not that many. And you're like, I'm going to prove you wrong. I, I, whatever. I, I'm not like, okay. I'm not saying like, okay, I'm just going to end that sentence elliptically and start my next paragraph. Okay. I think that what is distinctive about the lay vocation is to be excellent in the world, right? So that your baptismal graces transform this present evil age and make evident to those whom you meet that the Lord Jesus lives and that it is possible to have a relationship with him. In order to make that manifest, you don't need to do all of the things that a focus missionary does or that a religious does, for instance, okay? I think a lot of people have it in their minds that in order to be perfect, you have to be a religious. You have to be a focus missionary. You have to be involved in a lay Catholic apostolate, which trains people to engage, um, you know, on the media airwaves, right? So as to defend the church's teaching. And I have to hang out with Jason Conroy arm in arm and skip with him through the streets of Dublin. Um, actually, that is a really excellent way by which to become perfect. Um, so maybe I take back that last point. No, what I'm saying is that we shouldn't think about it so much in terms of behaviors as we should think about it principally as a response to God. Okay, so I think that religious life is good, obviously. I think that becoming a focused missionary is good, obviously. I think that daily mass is good. I think that biweekly confession is good. I think that having and cultivating excellent Christian friendships is good. I think that abstinence, fasting, I think that an ascetical life is good. I think that all of these things are good, but I think that they have to be incorporated into a story that is intensely personal, right? Because the Lord is calling you to be a saint. And there are certain things in the Christian tradition that arise as perennially helpful, as perennially efficacious, but they have to be passed through the peculiar relationship that you have with the Lord. Otherwise, we will find ourselves 
like lamenting that we have not been given the graces that have been given our peers or lusting after graces which are never to be accorded. The idea is to respond to what the Lord is actually giving you, okay? What he is actually giving you. So I think like some people have it in their minds, you know, like most people don't want to become religious. And then that's fine, okay? Because I think a lot of people, when they, when they recognize in their heart of hearts that they don't want to become a religious, they think about it as if it were like a liability or a defect or a fault. That is not the case, okay? Some people, okay, so this is like the syllogism that I often hear described. Either on the one hand, you hear this. I don't want to become a religious. Only religious become saints. Therefore, I'll never become a saint. That's false, okay? You might also other, hear other people saying like, I have no desire to become a priest or become a religious, right? But maybe that means that I'm supposed to be one right? Because it would be really difficult for me, really mortifying, very, very hard. It would probably be a life of unremitting pain and sorrow. I would feel socially isolated, probably depressed, completely overwhelmed by all of the duties and responsibilities that I had to adopt. And I would just be pining away thinking about marriage the entire time. So maybe that's a sign that the Lord Jesus is actually calling me to it because what is most difficult is in fact most efficacious and therefore I should go for it. No. Okay. No. What I'm trying to say is that both of these are bad ways by which to discern the Lord's call and purpose in your life. I'm conscious of the time. I will finish in two and a half minutes. Um, what I'm trying to say is that the way in which you become a saint is the way in which you become a saint. Well, that's like sage wisdom, you know, from like a Buddhist monk. Say something more helpful, Father Gregory. What I mean to say is this, okay. God is saving you according to the peculiar circumstances of your unique life, of your unique existence. God gives you what he commands, okay? And he commands what he wills, which is to say that you're responsible for what the Lord entrusts you with. So you needn't lament the fact that you may not be called to religious life. You need not lament the fact that you may not appear as holy as some of your peers. You need not lament the fact that you, yeah, whatever, dot, 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 okay? That you're not the greatest missionary, that you're not the greatest martyr. You are made to magnify the peculiar and personal graces that God actually gives you. This, I think, is the genius of the parable of the talents. To some, God gives five. To some, God gives two. To some, God gives one. But the same commendation, the same praise is accorded to the one who is given five and the one who is given two. Both prove faithful, and as a result of which, both prove fruitful. The one who is condemned is the one who looks around and compares his talent to that of the others and then does nothing with it. He comes in for con condemnation, not because he was afforded less, but because he did not consent to and cooperate with the graces that God gives. So how then are you called to pursue the perfection of charity? You are to work in accord with the graces that he actually gives you. And what is more, how he created you is an indication of how he intends to redeem you, which means that your desires, provided that they are healed and elevated by the grace of God, you know, you're going to mass, you're going to confession, you're adopting penances, you know, you, you have good friends on whom you can rely to tell you the truth. You, um, yeah, you have a habit of studying the faith, et cetera. Like these things are in place. You can trust your desires because God is working through your desires. If he had created you in one way, only to like scrap that created plan and then redeem you in an entirely different way, then his creation would be ill-begotten. It would fail in some way. Your desire is essentially good. And by virtuous formation, it can mature into a sense of your destiny. All right. Granted, there are fewer married saints than our religious and priests. But if you're made for marriage, God will make it known and he will sanctify you in that state. And so, in the end, perfection is personal and it is free. Ultimately, it means that you manifest the glory of God in a way that you are uniquely capable of doing in accord with the graces that God actually gives, not in accord with the graces that you might wish he had given. There are notes in the heavenly choir that only you can sing. There are hues and tints in the heavenly palette that only you can accent. God indicates your destiny and your flourishing by how he made you. He prompts you to pursue it by the desire which he breathed within you. And by the grace of the Holy Spirit, he accompanies you as you make strides to discern what exactly that is. For this command that I enjoin on you today is not too mysterious and remote for you. No, it is something very near to you, already in your mouths and in your hearts. You have only to carry it out. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay. I don't know what I'm supposed to do next. Is this the dancing part? <laughs> yes, we moved to the question and answer part. Um, oh, nice. Okay.
I yeah. suppose that's infinitely preferable to dancing. No, he should dance. He really, really Oh, you should. should always, always dance. <laughs> Father has moves. I can, I can confirm that. Nice. <laughs> oh, I'll scroll up. But first, we have the most important question. What is written on the mug? Oh, right. Um, we shall steer safely through every storm, so long as our heart is right, our intention fervent, our courage steadfast, and our trust fixed on God. St. Francis de Sales. It was given to me by some Nashville Dominicans who run a high school up in Baltimore or Catonsville, technically. So there you go. So I have a question. If you have a holy mug, does this make you perfect? Ah, that's an excellent question. The answer is yes. Right. <laughs> so perfection is to be acquired through um, shopping. Right. Although I, I would commend to your consideration, the essential place that shopping sometimes serves in the human heart. I don't know if you've had this experience. My sister refers to it as retail therapy. Perhaps, you know, like when the quarantine first set in, whatever that was, like the second week of March, for us, maybe it was earlier for you, but like you felt trapped, sad, anxious, terrified. And sometimes it's very, it's very helpful just to go on Amazon and then to buy a couple of things. Such has been my experience. My hiking boots just gave out on my last hiking trip, so I bought a new pair of boots. Felt incredible. Problem is, Washington, D.C. has these super taxes for having things shipped to us, so I ship them to my parents' house. So I haven't yet seen them. I have to pick them up later. That is truly tragic, Father. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad that you can appreciate my difficulty. Okay, so be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew 5, 48. How would this fit in with the idea that we are of a fallen nature and are not perfect? Mm-hmm. Dig. Cheers to Ellen Moynihan. Um, so, right. Uh, so excellent question. I think, um, so, so one thing is to understand what it means to have a fallen nature. And um, I actually gave a talk at UCD about precisely this. And um, I, was, I was the moment at which I first met Jason Conroy and the trajectory of my life took a radical upturn for the better. I was also the one I just, when I met you too. I remember that distinctly when we were walking to like from lunch at that burrito place. Was that with Ivan that we got those burritos? When you were talking about your burrito strategy? Yes. Yeah, my burrito strategy is the slow play. So this is actually the most formative thing that I'll say during our entire time together. If you want to get a big burrito, the key is the slow play. Whenever they ask you either this or this, you say one. And then once they've dolloped it, you say, I'd also like the other. So they'll say like black or pinto beans. And you say, I'll take some pinto beans. And then they put the pinto beans on your burrito. And then you say, I'd also like some black beans. Because if you say both, then they're going to give you half portions of both. But if you say one, then the other, then they're going to give you a full portion. And then like a third portion, you still end up about 33% in the bonus. It's a great strategy. So if you're looking for your burrito to burst with its contents, that's, that's the ticket. It's quite delicious. Um, okay, so uh, the question is, yeah, sorry, tangent. How would this fit in with the idea that we're of a fallen nature and not perfect? Right, so uh, we were created in a state of original justice with our minds subordinated to God by grace, with our lower powers, like our emotions, subordinated to our higher powers, like intellect and will, and what we call integral nature. And then with our bodies subjected to our souls in a state that kind of like radiated the logic of grace through every member of our body. Uh, so we enjoyed immortality and impassibility. So you wouldn't die, you wouldn't suffer corruption. Um, so when we sinned, we lost original justice. So we lost grace, we lost integral nature. And then, um, you know, like we lost those associated privileges of immortality and impassibility. But what is important to note is that with original sin, we lose grace and our inclination to virtue is weakened, but our nature is essentially unaltered. So original sin does not make us bad. Effectively, what original sin does is that it leaves us to ourselves we are just left to ourselves. We are created, you know, ordered to the supernatural destiny and grace reorients it to us as we are healed and purified in the life, you know, of the sacraments, et cetera. Right. But, but our nature remains, remains broken open to the possibility of God's self-offering in the life of grace. Um, so we can be made perfect, right? You can be made perfect ultimately in heaven, but there's some like debate among mystical theologians in the church as to whether or not one can entirely root out venial sin during the course of his or her life. And some of them will say yes. So the promise of the life of virtue is that we could be reconstituted in this kind of integral nature so that our lower powers are subordinated to our higher powers. 
And we kind of like regain what was lost in the garden, but in the context of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So our, our nature has been wounded, right, and despoiled of grace, but we can hope for healing and elevation in the life of grace such that this perfection about which we speak, a perfection proper to what it means to be a human being, mind you, not divine perfection, not angelic perfection, not animal perfection, not plant perfection, not rock perfection, that we can actually hope to enjoy that, right, and to abide in it, and ultimately to abide it in heaven. So I hope that's helpful. Um, there you go. Next question. Should you only make decisions about your vocation in times of consolation? Or is this still incorrect as we need to look at the times we have been in desolation also? Right. An excellent question. I'm saying mass in an hour, so I'm going to cease drinking chai. Oof. I wash my mug like once a month. So sometimes you get things at the bottom that are a little bit exciting. Um, right. So I'm about to say something that's a bit iconoclastic. Um, I don't really buy the whole consolation and desolation thing. Why, Father Gregory? Because it was an idea that was enunciated by a Jesuit and you are um, a bigot, yeah, probably. Um, but also because I, I haven't found it to work especially well. Okay, I just haven't found it to work especially well. Because my experience of the religious, excuse me, of, of the Christian life is that I say, Lord Jesus, I believe, and I listen, and then I hear nothing, and then I go to bed. And that's like how most days go. And I don't mean to suggest by that that the Lord is like um, an absent parent or has been especially distant from me. But but I don't I don't experience these things often in terms of consolation and desolation. There were like a couple of moments in my life, you know, in the mid '90s, where I felt something about the faith. But since then, I haven't had an especially rich emotional experience. Does that make me a defective human being? I don't think so. Um, but you being Irish men and women, I, I don't suspect that emotion is an exceedingly important part of your own faith journey, right? Um, I don't know if you've ever heard the comedian John Mulaney, but he has the joke, he says to the effect basically that uh, I'm, I'm Irish, which means that I have all of my emotions and I keep them right here and then I die. Um, so this is my experience basically of a religious life is that you don't get much feedback from the Lord, right? Because what's the point of life, right? The point of life is the loving vision of God. And how does the Lord secure that? By growth in faith and charity. How does he secure growth in faith? It's often by having you act faithfully. And the problem with emotional feedback is that it's easy to get lost in the loveliness of emotional feedback because it feels so delicious, right? But the Lord can ensure that you will have to believe, posit acts of faith and cling to him tenaciously if he removes those things. Why? Because he's stern and aloof? No, but because he loves he loves in a way that is perfectly attuned to your growth. So I don't think that one will feel especially good before, during, or after his or her discernment to religious life. I think you will recognize in it, and the thing that I would best describe the feeling as is a metaphysical fit. Like you can recognize that this is a thing that is somehow for me. It's something that like leaps out of the otherwise neutral fabric of life. Like when I walk past families, you know, that are like playing with their kids, I'm like, dude, cute baby got to hold it. But at the end of like 20 minutes, um, after the, the child has been completely devastated by the experience of being held by a six foot four man dressed in all white, you know, held a, like kind of at a distance from his mother, and I hand the child back. I'm not like, would that I could hold him more. I'm just like, that was cool. All right, moving on in life. Um, whereas like when I think about St. Maximilian Kolbe, it, I'm like shaken to the core. I think about a man who so very much loved the Lord and the blessed mother that he endeavored the things that he did. That's awesome. Like I want to die like he did. Um, a kind of side point of St. Maximilian Kolbe. This is like the point of religious life. Okay. The point of religious life is to be so given to the Lord that you're already dead. So um, St. Maximilian Kolbe, you know that like the arrangement was when somebody escaped from Auschwitz, they would kill 10 persons from that cell block in reprisal. Um, and that uh, this gentleman, Franciszek Kowanczyk, was one of those 10 selected. And then when he was selected, he said, quote, my wife, my kids. And that uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe stepped forward and said, quote, I am a priest. I will die in his place. And that he did. Well, they put him in a starvation chamber and the nine other men died. He himself could not be killed in such a paltry manner, right? He was singing hymns and spiritual songs, encouraging each of those with whom he was, in, you know, imprisoned until such time as they expired. But ultimately he had to be killed by lethal injection for too strong was he, stronger than death itself. The thing that's wild is that no one had actually escaped. They thought someone had escaped, but then they found that man's corpse in the latrine a couple of days later. 
Okay. So, so there was these, these 10 men who were put in a cell block were, were put in that cell block to no purpose. Also, Franciszek Ivanchek, he said, my wife, my children. At the time, both his wife and his children had already been killed in a concentration camp. Okay. So when you think about it, why, why did Maximilian Kolbe do what he did? He did it for nothing. For absolutely nothing in the esteem of the world. But for him to simply say, I am a priest, his life could not have gone otherwise. And Franciszek Ivanchek actually wrote that later. He said, having survived, I felt great guilt, you know, that I, that basically I'd lived in place of St. Maximilian Kolbe, who was a much better man than I. But he said, gradually, I came to discover that a man such as he could not do otherwise. And I think that's like, when you discern a vocation, you come to discover that such is the case with you, that you could not do otherwise, right? Because the way that the Lord has placed a claim on your life has come to such like concrete and particular expression that to walk away from it would be to deny something uh, very essential about who you are and who God is and the way in which God has proved himself faithful. Now, you might think like, well, Father Gregory, that's mildly inspirational, but also maddening because it gives me no practical help. You have to trust that the Lord loves your destiny more than you do, right? And then he's going to communicate it as adequately as he sees fit to communicate it. And that your life now, presently, is worth it, even if it's not in a settled state, because the Lord is still giving you himself. The Lord is still loving you unto himself. He is still giving sufficient indication so that you can embrace the vocation, which may or may not come. You might die single, alone, and frustrated, but your life will still be precious to the Lord, and you can still make something of it because the Lord has already made something of it. So I would say that like when we try to look for like consolation and desolation or we try to make of it some kind of like deductive science whereby I determine my vocation, we're always trying to cheat the system. The system is to wait on the Lord and to suffer his timing, which is terrible and exhausting. And I wish it were otherwise, but it's not. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was about to drink chai compulsively, but I said I wouldn't. We have a serious request. Yeah. Would could. You have been asked for a dance-off between yourself and Ivan. Do you agree to the challenge? Yeah, absolutely. Great. You go first, Ivan. <laughs> Only shoulders and neck. We need music. <laughs> Only play a song. What song? What have I done? <laughs> Put my back out last time I did one of these things. I need to be careful. Um, I don't know what you just said, but it sounded like a threat. I'm ready. Put on the space background, <laughs> Ivan. <laughs> all right we'll wait till ivan collects himself you can go ahead and read the next question okay um well, how do you know when your desires are trustworthy uh short answer you don't <laughs> wow more helpful tips from father gregory pine what was the point of this talk was the point of this talk just to basically convince me that the lord loves me in the dark yes that is the whole point, okay? Um, it's hard to say when your desires are trustworthy because we are infinitely capable of self-deception. Infinitely capable of self-deception. The one thing I would say is that the Lord gives us a variety of testimony, okay? And that by the confluence of that testimony, we come to discern where our desire fits within his grand designs. So for instance, he gives us like the scriptures. He gives us the tradition. He gives us the testimony of theologians and saints. He gives us um, the church's law. He gives us um, our own interior lights, you know, by grace, by virtue, by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, by your own particular prudence. Um, he gives you good friends, right, who serve both as an inspiration and as a rebuke um, with whom we can consult. I would say like kind of getting down to the nitty gritty and practical, you think about the virtue of prudence. How does one make a prudent decision? Well, it's, it's by the living of a whole life. So if you are virtuous, you know, then you see reality more adequately. Say that, say that you're intemperate. Say that you're given to, to excess in drink. Um, when you are kind of like posed with a situation um, where drink is involved, it's more likely that your judgments aren't trustworthy, right? For instance, it's a Monday night. You have an exam the next morning. You still have three hours worth of studying to do, but your friend asks you, you know, like to have a little nip, you know, before you head out to the library. Because you're intemperate, you're more likely to be seduced by that offer, even though you recognize that it is not for your good. But if you are temperate, then you're able to look at that offer and recognize the place that it occupies within your life, hold it off at arm's length, get about your studying, get a decent right's rest, and do well on your exam. So one thing is you need to be well-formed. You know, you need to have cultivated a life of virtue. Next thing is, I mean, it's helpful to consult your experience and then to consult um, the counsel of others. So two parts of, of prudence are referred to as you know, memory 
and then docility. So I think that like the only foolproof way is time. You know, time is the kind of arena whereby God reveals his saving designs. And uh, you can consult your past experience of these things. Uh, and then you can consult others' experience of these things, specifically those who are older, who are wiser, who have suffered, who have loved, et cetera. So like, for instance, I don't know if you guys have Chex Muddy Buddies, uh, your side of the pond, um, but you like heat up peanut butter and chocolate, then you cover Chex in them, and then you throw in powdered sugar. It's incredible, especially when they clump together. It's absolutely divine. I know from past experience that the only limit to my consumption of Chex Muddy Buddies is the bottom of the bowl, okay? So it's the type of food that when I start eating it, Eventually, like at a certain point, I black out and then I wake up with like an empty bowl next to me just covered in powdered sugar. And I have to ask myself, like, what just happened? And I just piece it together based on the testimony of those who witnessed this like monstrous event in overindulgence. So I just know that like when I get checks, Muddy Buddies, I have to get, you know, like the four ounce package. Um, and if I don't do that, then I just can't be relied upon. So I, I consult my past memory of having just devastated checks, Muddy Buddies, and I adjust accordingly. Um, but also with respect to docility, you, you know, the experience where you realize that you're doing something wrong and you want to stop doing something wrong, but you feel like you're unable to tell your friends about it. You've probably had this experience or there are certain things that you don't want to bring up with your spiritual director because you suspect that he's going to make you change and you don't want to change, right? It's those types of things where we have a really acute experience of self-deception. So what do we do instead? Well, it means honesty with ourselves and with others. It means real accountability. It means investing in friendships. It means, over, you know, like sharing and um, being held accountable in a way, yeah, that like actually like places demands on you and may actually feel uncomfortable. Um, and it means asking the Lord for reproof, um, for correction, for illumination, for lights and insights. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, I wanted to get married until such time as I recognized that what I really wanted was to be a religious um, because I had all of these kind of virtuous desires to be devout, to be wholly given to the Lord, to do great and glorious things, to be perfect in charity. And I could see those all coherent with, you know, like a, a married life. But then I read a life about St. Thomas Aquinas and I was like, I see how these, these desires come together in his uh, concrete witness. And that's, that's what I want. I want to love the Lord like he does. So you keep growing in the life of virtue. And then when you are presented with the types of things for which your heart is well suited, you'll recognize them because yeah, like is known by like. Wow. Long answer. Wildly unhelpful. Never again. That was great. Um, is GK Chesterton a good model of Christian holiness? Is GK Chesterton a good model of Christian holiness? Um, in some ways, yes. Um, so certainly like his, his cause was open for, um, at the diocesan level for consideration by the ordinary, but then it was, I think the, the cause was shortly thereafter suspended. And I don't know all the reasons for that. Um, I think that like, yeah, there are things about GK Chesterton which commend him as a, as a holy individual. Um, I have to be honest, I, I have read a lot of G.K. Chesterton. I have not read a lot about G.K. Chesterton. Um, so I tried reading the, uh, the biography by Maisie Ward, and I just didn't get too terribly far. Um, but based on what I know of what he's written, I know that he has great insights into the faith, um, which insight seems to correspond with a life of virtue, right? So like a life of faith, a life of charity. Um, and in a sense, like in a sense, I mean, it's, you can kind of make a judgment as to how well someone loves by how they describe love, but also because of the types of insights that he has, right? So the type of um, kind of like penetration that he has into the things of the faith, because love gives you a sensitivity to the things as they are described. Um, and apart from love, there are certain things to which we do not have real access. And it's so very evident that he loves the Lord, right? And that he loves those uh, whom the Lord has given him, specifically his wife. Uh, it's fascinating. He, he doesn't write about his wife at all in his autobiography. He says, because were I to begin writing of her, I would not cease to write of her, something along those lines. He also dedicates, uh, one of his early poems is called The Ballad of the White Horse, which is cool. I actually recommend that. Um, a Celt favors uh, prominently and well in that, in that poem. Um, it's like a kind of an epic poem. It's eight long poems altogether. Uh, but he dedicated it to his wife, Francis, and he said, therefore, I bring these lines to thee who brought the cross to me because she had been, you know, a, a big part of his conversion to Christianity. 
Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't really know exactly how to make that judgment, but based on his writings, it seems that, um, yeah, it seems that he, he loved well, right. And he had great faith, but, um, yeah, beyond that as to whether or not he exhibited heroic virtue, I'd probably have to know more about his life. Do Catholics believe in total depravity? Depravity? They do not. Um, total depravity is the judgment that there is nothing about our nature that can be scrapped. Uh, so like the entirety of human nature has been consigned to the rubbish heap um, after the fall, that we're not even capable of, of the, the least of good things. Whereas St. Thomas is more sanguine about our capacities. He says something like, you know, there are certain things that we can do apart from the grace of God. They're modest, but they're still good. And I think he mentions like building roads and planting vineyards, you know, like, the, you know, you just look around and you see that there are a lot of people, even people who are living outside the bounds of the church, who are able to do good things. And in that you can see like what human nature is capable of, even a modicum of, you know, concern for one's brothers and sisters. We wouldn't refer to it as charity in the strict sense because we, we wouldn't make a judgment as to whether or not charity is operative in that person's life outside of the ordinary means. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, like people are capable of being good. Um, <clears throat> and so it would have been easier to be good had we not fallen because, uh, the original sin represents a step back. But like I said, it, it's the loss of grace. It's uh, a weakening of the inclination to virtue, but it, it leaves our nature intact for it. were St. Thomas basically makes the argument that if it were to completely change our nature or to deprive us of the use of reason, um, then it would be like. It, it, it would almost make us a different species. And then we would no longer be capable of sin because if we're not, if we're like truly and absolutely not capable of knowing or of uh, loving, then we're not responsible. Um, so it would have the paradoxical effect of rendering us entirely free from blame, which would be a bit strange. To live out charity to the best of our abilities, it is true, good, and proper that we should always put the other first, right? And how can we do this be selfless? Any pressure? Right. No pressure. Um, here we go. Here's another iconoclastic answer. You don't, you shouldn't always put the other first. Why? Because I'm selfish and I want other people to be selfish. So that way I feel less terrible by comparison. Maybe. No. Um, so what's the, uh, what's the idea? <clears throat> um, so St. Augustine describes the order of charity or the order of amoris. And he says, there are certain things for which we are more responsible and certain things for which we are less responsible. And for him, the principle of like what we ought to love, the hierarchy of what we ought to love is based on union. Okay. So um, we ought to love God most because God is more interior to ourselves than we are to ourselves um, because God is the principle of our being. He is our origin and end. Um, God gives us all that we are and uh, all that we hope to be. And then next he says we should love ourselves because he says union is the principle of unity. So you should love your neighbor as yourself and you kind of look out for yourself in a certain sense before you look out for others in the ordinary course. <clears throat> uh, because like for instance, let's say you have $5 and you need those $5 to pay your rent or you will die of uh, exposure, you know, to make these terms kind of drastic you are you ought to retain the use and or the possession and use of that five dollars rather than giving it away to those who may be poorer than you because you're responsible for securing your own kind of welfare before you are for securing the welfare of others um now you might think this sounds selfish <clears throat> well i think the the kind of dichotomy that is drawn between being selfish and being selfless is somewhat unhelpful okay because love is not about yeah like um, destroying your own personality so that others might flourish. Love is about being in pursuit together of a common good. Um, and part of that common good is just a shared life. So what do I mean by this? I'm sweating so much. <clears throat> you can put on your fan. We couldn't hear it. Oh, that's such great news. I'm about to cool down. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Um, so yes. So what am I trying to say? I think when we think about love, a, a more helpful consideration is, is to think about it in terms of the common good. 
Okay. So rather than think about like, I need to affirm this other person and deny myself, or I need to deny my, or excuse me, I need to deny this other person and affirm myself as if it were just a choice between selfishness and altruism. Rather, we should think about it as being together on the way towards God. It's a kind of form of accompaniment or like a form of common pursuit. Um, C.S. Lewis describes this in The Four Loves, where he says that it's true of friends that they go kind of like side by side or arm in arm towards a common goal. Um, he says also that it, in order to have friends, uh, you need to want something more than friends, right? So if you're like to go to one of your friends and say, well, somebody whom you just meet, for instance, and say, like, I've never had a friend before, like, maybe you could be my friend. Uh, that's creepy. And that's an excellent way by which to assure that you will never become friends with this individual. Whereas if you say like, I love um, the Barack Obama Plaza, you know, I just want to drive to County Offaly so I can visit it and drink its delicious chai, you know, and maybe worship at the sign sometimes like happened in 2016. Um, right. So then you might find somebody else, you know, you might find a fellow traveler who says like, I love the, whatever that was road, was that the N7? Is that the N7? What goes between Dublin and, and Galway? What's up? It's the, it's the N6. Oh, man. Sean Hurley, man. I was, I was, I was high on life there for a second. Um, okay, it's better to be brought down to earth. So uh, when, you, when you describe to somebody your common interests, right, then you have the hope that you could actually find in them uh, a fellow traveler. So I think that when it comes to adjudicating these claims of being selfish and selfless, there are certain things which will be forced upon you as a human being and which one ought to embrace right? So like, um, you know, your children get up at night and they cry and they need to be coddled and fed. It's not a matter of you denying yourself and affirming your child. It's a matter of you being in pursuit of the common good of your family. Okay. So don't pitch yourself against your child as if your child were an infinite sea of needs who is constantly demanding of you that you get poor sleep, how very selfish that child is, right? Because if you set it up as selfish or altruistic, then the other people stand to you know, like suffer by comparison and think about your own experience. Like, do you ever want to be on the receiving end of somebody who says like, I really want to do something else, but I should hang out with Anya Lee. You know, if you can recognize that in another person, it's like, listen, I don't want to be your charity case, sweetheart. Like I want to be together on the way to something that we both find engrossing and engaging. I don't want to be the object of another person's altruism. I'd rather be left alone to read in my room. I'm just as happy. Okay. Um, wow, that sounded severe, Father Gregory. You seem like very personally involved in this thing. No, I mean, like most people don't care too terribly much. So I haven't like suffered from this type of altruism, but, but you've probably experienced it. Sorry, like my eyes like flare up, like I'm about to explode. You've experienced it sometime in conversation when you feel like another person has it in their mind that in order to be selfless in a conversation, they should talk to you about things that you're interested in or like elicit your opinion about what you think. But, but at a certain point in that conversation, like who are you and what do you think? And why can't we get to common themes of interest like conversation isn't so much a matter of like me asking you the things about you. It's a matter of us finding common engrossing subjects so that we can be together on the way towards a more perfect understanding of God and of reality, thereby we can love better. Um, so yeah, that's the basic idea. <laughs> How do we deal with failure when going along the path of perfection, aside from confession, et cetera? So um, what was I going to say? Uh, oh yeah, Searching for and Maintaining Peace by Jacques Philippe, um, who is great. Yeah, just like a very, very excellent spiritual guide. But one thing that he stresses about failure is that failure ought not derail us. So oftentimes the evil one gets us to rely overly much upon ourselves, um, which is a very subtle way of making it such that our disappointments and failures register um, all the more devastatingly. Um, so like if you fail and you've been relying overly much on yourself, dude, that's awesome. I have to vote for Ivan. It's Dominican law. You can't vote for yourself. Um, you're not yet a Dominican Ivan, so you can vote for yourself. Um, so, um, yeah, when we rely overly much on ourselves, then we only have ourselves to blame for having, uh, faltered or failed. And then we like start with this kind of series of recriminations where it's like, how could you do that? Or like, blah, 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 thus and such. And it's very difficult to get back up because we thought that we were progressing. We thought that we had rooted out habitual sin. We thought that we had amounted to something in life. And we come to discover that all of that apparent progress was actually, you know, it was a lie or it was just a, a momentary or fleeting experience of the grace of God. And in that, you know, Jacques Philippe says, like, basically, uh, the saint is not the one who does not fall, but rather the one when falling or having fallen, who kind of gets back up without being disquieted. 
The most important thing is to maintain interior peace. He uses this image of a, of a mountain lake. You can think of like Lake Lucerne or something like that. Do I know any mountain lakes in Ireland? No. What's that one you're like driving around Connemara and you come to that abbey that a bunch of tourists go to? Um, never mind. It doesn't matter. Okay. So, um, yeah. So he says, like, picture a mountain lake. And he says, when the, when, the, when the surface of the lake is placid or serene, it reflects the rays of the sun perfectly. Uh, but when the surface of the lake is agitated, it does not. He says, our interior lives are like this with respect to the grace of God. So when we are placid or serene interiorly, then the grace of God is reflected perfectly in and through us. But when we're agitated, it's not. And so like at a certain point in your spiritual life, you just come to the recognition, like if I am to become holy, Lord, then you're going to have to do it. Because if I keep exhausting myself in these vain efforts and then falling, failing, and then hating myself as a result, I will always and ever be caught up in this, yeah, this like perfection hustle, which isn't a true Christian perfection, but a kind of crazed, maniacal, anxious perfectionism. So I think this like idea of searching for and maintaining peace is hugely important. Kyle Moore Abbey, what's up? That's the one I'm thinking about. And yes, yeah, so uh, I think that, that reading that book is, is my advice. Searching for and maintaining peace by Jacques Philippe. It's super short. It's like a pamphlet, you know, like a hundred pages, but they're small pages and it's just so delightful. You can read it in an hour and a half. How do you recognize signs and indications from God? How do we know we are not just deceiving ourselves and creating these things on our own? How do we know we are not deceiving ourselves or just doing these things on our own? Um, I mean, you don't, um, but you get better at it. I think like, so here I want to address um, a fear that many of us have. I think a lot of us are afraid of getting the answer wrong. And we think about Christian life as if it were a matter of flipping to the back of the book and checking the answer key as we go along the way. The real drama of Christian existence is that you don't, you don't see the answer key until the general resurrection, really. Or you see it in the vision of God, so maybe a little bit before that. Um, what's most important is that you soldier well, that you proceed um, faithfully, right? You might make the wrong decision, but, but you're one imperfect or you're one um, perhaps selfish or your one uh, ugly decision is not going to undo the plan of God in your life. I think a lot of us are afraid of get, you know, getting the wrong answer basically, and then having to suffer forever the effects of our choice. You know, like you read a Henry James novel and you come across this female, uh, you know, like a uh, character who passes up two, you know, excellent suitors and then settles on the third who ends up being a rogue and then she's trapped in a bad marriage for the rest of her life. We basically think that all of us think that this is going to happen to us, but we're just going to miss our vocation and we're just going to have to suffer the effects thereof. God is not like this, right? Think about the, the vision of God that emerges from that. God is like a GRE, you know, like test supervisor who's just waiting at the little window, like watching you to see if you'll fail. So that way he can punish you. He's like, yes, yes, almost, almost time. That's insane. That's insane. Rather think about the way as strewn with signs from God. Rather think about the way as like replete with various instances in which the Lord is mediating his grace and communicating his will and loving you to the next point, right? Oftentimes we don't see him or we don't acknowledge him, but it doesn't make it any, le any the less real. Like we have to trust that God loves our destiny more than we do um, and that he's going to give us um, ample indication. Um, so how do we determine like what we're made for? It's like, what do you love? What are you already in pursuit of? Think about the concrete circumstances of your life, of your family, of your polity, of your church, of the demands of your local parish, of the religious orders that are doing well in your country, of how you intend to spend your time. You know, like I think like choosing something because your friend is there is an excellent reason, right? You know, you have the privilege of living in a small country and so you can all stay pretty close regardless. But in the United States, people do stupid things. Like they get into two graduate schools and their best friend is going to one of them, but the other one is a place that has a higher or a better academic reputation and will mire them yet more further in debt. And they're like, I'll go to this one so I can have esteem. It's like, who gives a flying rip? You know, I think that choosing people whom you love and choosing to stay with them is an adequate reason for doing most everything in life. And so, yeah, Washington Square for the win. Yeah, I was thinking specifically of Portrait of a Lady. I'm like halfway through that right now and she's about to make a big mistake. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, we could get more into concrete details, but I think that's something that's helpfully sussed out with a spiritual director because it's so very personal. But I think the big point is to trust that the Lord is giving indication and that your, your growth as a, as a human being, as an individual, um, is, is just uh, shot through with these types of, of kind of like protestations of love from the Lord. 
Amazing. Next question. Can one consider communication a virtue in the loose sense of the word? Communication enhances our relationship with God, ourselves, and others. Um, right. Could you repeat that? Actually, is it in the group chat? It's at 9.08 p.m. from PAX. From PAX. Ah, right. Um, so St. Thomas has a virtue of like friendliness, which he calls... Um, amicability or affability, right? And I think that like being open to others and having a, a facility for sharing with others is virtuous. He also has a virtue which he describes as truth, like basically giving others an accurate representation of what you think, what you feel, but to do so appropriately. Um, you can also think of like liberality, you know, like a kind of generous giving of oneself in ordinary circumstances, things like that. So I think that like communication entails a lot of different dimensions, which dimensions are accounted for in other virtues, but I mean, if you refer to communication as a virtue, that's fine. I don't, I don't think that's going to upset the ship. It's not going to be like, well, if you say that communication is a virtue, you know, next thing you know, the Eucharist isn't a sacrament, you know, so no, I think it's, if you think about it in those terms, I think that's fine. But there, yeah, there are other ways by which to account for it. Question. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay, here we go. I wrote it down. Um, you know, like, okay, so Augustine says this really annoying thing which is um, uh, like, okay, it's in, it's in the Summa uh, in the section on like virginity as, as a state in life. And he, Augustine says that um, like, there's, there's no way that the good of childbearing or, or, or of like marriage can ever uh, match up to like lost virginity as in like lose. So I, I assume he's only talking about a person where like their vocation was to, was to like religious life or something and they got married instead. But anyway, um, well, a wise man once said, uh, comparison breeds contempt. So I was thinking that, like, you know how you said that the common good, like, we're all, we're all for, like, uh, the common good. And St. Therese says that we're all different flowers in the field, but we all make one beautiful picture. And if we were all one type of flower, the picture would be less beautiful. So in that way, could you say that, like, everyone's, like, the good that everyone has, so Mary has, like, the highest good? with being the mother of God and, or not the highest, but second highest, probably after the incarnation and there's different levels. But is there a way that because all of these things are kind of for the common good that we kind of all possess them because we all participate in the common good of like all of creation. So is it true to say that because it's all for the common good and we all participate in the common good of all creation and in some way we possess the good, the, the, the higher goods that other people have, you know, that like, that's for us in a way that, you know, it's for our sake or that we, we kind of have it because we're all in the one team. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna have to go after this one, by the way. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's a good observation. I, I, th I think that um, what we don't want to say is that the Lord gives some people more gifts than others, because he intends those gifts for the, the church, kind of simply. I think the Lord, the Lord, the reason for which the Lord loves some more than others is unclear, you know, because it's, it's, yeah, his wisdom is unsearchable. Um, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor. And uh, so he has reasons uh, which we cannot fully sound. And yet we can appreciate how they are good in the context of the mystical body. One of the reasons for which is what you suggest there. And so you think about the Blessed Mother, for instance, that her divine maternity is so fruitful that it begets um, a kind of ecclesial maternity. So she who is the mother of God becomes at the foot of the cross, the mother of the church. She who, um, you know, like the Lord Jesus, what the Lord Jesus merits in strict justice, she merits by a kind of fittingness or by a kind of friendship. And so she serves with the Lord as a kind of co-redemptrix, right? I mean, obviously subjected to, subordinated to, of an infinitely lower sort. But, you know, like you can see how this, this works itself out in the Lord's plan for redemption and how very fitting it is in the spiritual order that we who have a father in God have a kind of mother in the Blessed Virgin Mary. So yes, his loving her in excellent fashion proves uh, ultimately to be very beneficial for us, you know, very blessed indeed. So I think that you can see how the Lord doesn't do things arbitrarily, which isn't to say that we can always discern the reason for which he does things, but we can trust that they are to the good um, and that uh, they will ultimately redound to his glory and to the salvation of souls, not just souls in general in some kind of like cosmic sense, but of each of our individual souls uh, for he has searched us and known us. He knows when we sit and when we stand, when we rise and go to sleep and he makes all these things conspire to our good. Yeah.
Fantastic. Well, we've loved having you on here, Father Gregory Pye, and hopefully we'll get to get you again sometime. Dig. So, Cheers. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Until the next time. <laughs> Would you like to close us in prayer? With pleasure. Amazing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son of God, great are you and glorious, wonderful in power and unsurpassable. You have created us each individually and to great purpose. You have sown in our hearts devout and magnanimous desires. Help, Lord God, by your inspirations and encouragements that we might consent to and cooperate with what you give and that it might take root in our hearts and come to full flourishing, that by the embrace of each of our vocations, we might glorify you and might save many souls whom you entrust to our care. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may Almighty God bless us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I would say good night, but I imagine you're staying up a few more hours. I am indeed. Yeah. Okay. Cheers. Until the next time. Until the next time. Go Bye, bless. Father. Bye. Thanks for coming. Amazing. Wow. Ha <laughs> ha.